we need you to tell us if a particular technology that was being investigated uh, meets the needs for autonomy. And I said, okay, uh, and you know, where are those requirements? You know? Welcome to this series of GNSS Conversation. I'm very excited about today's topic as we're going to talk about navigation at the age of autonomy with former Stanford GPS Lab Fellow and entrepreneur, Dr. Tyler B. Hello, Tyler. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Maggie. How are you? Pretty good, pretty good. Tyler, for people who don't already know you, you're a researcher, you're an entrepreneur, and you did your PhD at Stanford Research Lab and you're the guidance of Dr. Per Engie and Dr. Todd Waller. Uh, among a lot of topics, uh, low orbit constellation for navigation is a major focus point, uh, and we'll get back to that uh, at the end of this interview. You've also worked for Google, and for a few years, you've been working with Ford on GNSS uh, autonomous vehicles before starting this new company, uh, we're focusing on geo-based uh, uh, navigation. So maybe we can start with your work at Ford. Uh, I've seen you presented at ACE uh, 2019 in Detroit, and that was the industry's first set of localization requirement for autonomous vehicles, right? Okay, can you tell us a bit more about it and why was it so important? Yeah, absolutely. Um, autonomous vehicle requirements were important to us because really the community needed something to work towards. They needed a set of standards for safety, and you know, how do we get there in the end? And really this all started with my first day at Ford, so not to you know, drag this story out too long. So they said, Tyler, we need you to tell us if a particular technology that was being investigated uh, meets the needs for autonomy. And I said, okay, uh, and you know, where are those requirements? You know, and I'll, I'll, I'll take a look and I'll, I'll try to figure out how we can evaluate that. And they said, well, you know, you're the expert, we hired you, you tell us. <laughs> And so, uh, meanwhile, I had been an autonomous vehicle engineer for a day, and uh, so I started to ask around the department, started to ask around, you know, both internally and externally uh, from Ford to see, you know, if any requirements such as this existed. And uh, really, the answer that we came to was that there really wasn't anything out there. And this was kind of a foreign concept to me. You know, I was coming from an aerospace background, where really the requirements are driving the designs in a lot of these aerospace systems. Um, but I think what it was was that in the self-driving domain, um, everything was still very early. This was, you know, in 2017 now, um, and it was still unclear what was even possible from these systems. So it was hard to get a set of requirements because it was still exploratory as to what was even possible that these systems might be able to, to perform. And so what was important was for us to sort of start and say, okay, well, what, what should be a goal for ourselves internally and then start working with the community to to establish you know, what should be the safety requirements and therefore what should be the, the goal for our, for our subsystem, which was localization, which was my background. So tell us a bit more about the process. Uh, I'll say we were in a very, we were fortunate to be in this unique position at Ford uh, because really we got to interact with really everyone in the domain that was working on this problem. So this was the tier one and tier two automotive suppliers, uh, the new innovative startups in Silicon Valley, but also elsewhere in the world and other technology companies as well. So it really gave us a great perspective. You know, we could sort of look at all these groups of people working on this same problem and see what was common between them and see what was, um, you know, the good things that sort of everyone was sort of working on together. And what was advantageous about that is that all of these groups from these different backgrounds um, were working on this problem, but they were also looking to Ford to say, hey, you know, OEM, who's putting together the system, Ford as the systems integrator, um, you know, what should this system look like? What are the requirements? And so what we did is we started gathering the thinking and targets that were sort of, we were seeing in the community, which ranged from, you know, mostly folks just trying to build a self-driving system all at once and then see, okay, localization of about this much seems to make the system work well. So our requirement is something like 10 centimeters, something like that. And that's a kind of hand wavy answer when you're trying to make such a complex system. And um, we sort of used that as a guiding point. But then what we did was, uh, once we had you know, surveyed that information, we then built a team internally and sort of gathered folks from a bunch of different uh, departments within, the, within Ford. Uh, so these were folks from the uh, ADAS group, so this is um, Advanced Driver Assistance, 
Uh, so they're kind of level two autonomy features, so more like the autopilots uh, from Tesla and things like that that are sort of on the road today. The Cadillac Super Cruise is another example of this, things that are com commercially available uh, to consumers. Um, as well as folks from the level four sort of fully autonomous vehicle group. So this is still, um, these are things targeting robo taxis, no one is sitting in the driver's seat, so no oversight, so fully autonomous. Um, but also importantly, folks from systems engineering, uh, production, and also functional safety. So people who actually build vehicles and understood uh, what was needed to bring these things to production, especially the functional safety element of it. The requirements are really different for different levels of autonomy. You know, so the level four system, which a human has no oversight of, uh, the requirements are much stricter than for a system where the human is expected to be monitoring the situation at all times. So getting everyone to speak the same language was, I think, a big piece of, of making that happen. And fundamentally, our approach was you know, to mimic that taken in civil aviation. And so my background was in GNSS and GPS for civil aviation. And you know, how, do you do, how do you make a high integrity system to support safety critical operations uh, in that domain? And what we did is we set a target uh, for the safety of autonomous vehicles. Uh, we said, okay, where should we start? Well, if you look at civil aviation, they have a great track record. This is how they started. This is how you know we can humans can make transportation systems that achieve a certain level of safety. We should probably adhere to the same level of standards uh, as that domain, which is a, a great place to start. And then we started, you know, that as our target, and then work backwards through the system to see what that necessarily implies about the individual components. And eventually we worked all the way back to localization, which turns out to have very strict requirements in the end because it is the first step in that whole autonomous driving chain. It is, you know. Where am I? What's around me? Where are all those things going? Where should I go? And then actually go there. And so because it is the first thing in the chain, it is a very important uh, piece of it. For all those people working in autonomous driving now, like what are the, the most important takeaways from all this research? I think the first one was that it's extremely hard. And the requirements we came to um, really said that you know, the integrity levels that you're trying to hit, so the level of safety that we're trying to hit is not that it's unprecedented. Um, aviation, rail, maritime all have very well set requirements that, you know, the industries uh, have put forth. Um, but automotive was kind of new to the game. And although it has similar targets of safety and integrity, the difference is the position protection level. And the difference is, is that in aviation and maritime, you need to know your position to tens of meters. This comes down to, you know, you need to be able to get to the runway, which is, you know, 35 meters or is sort of what the requirement comes down to for that. Um, in rail, to know what track you're on, it's a, a matter of meters because that's sort of the spacing between the tracks. But in automotive, you have to keep your car within the lane. And when a car is two meters wide and the lane is three meters wide, there's not a whole lot more room left over. And it turns out that you need to know the position of the vehicle to about 30 centimeters. And so the difference is um, you have to adhere to the same integrity level, so the same you know, level of reliability, uh, but now you need to do it at 30 centimeters instead of 35 meters. And so it really was an unprecedented challenge. Uh, the second one was that you, know, you have to be able to now make a system that works at this six sigma reliability. So this is you know, one failure in a billion mile level system. How do you prove that it actually does that? And so that's a difficult challenge even in itself because um, I think the approach that a lot of folks have been taking is that you go out and drive a lot of miles. Uh, you know, a lot of these autonomous systems have done millions of miles of driving at this point, but millions of miles does not come close to the billions of miles you need to prove that the system is, is doing what you claim it is doing to actually improve the safety on the road today. And so this um, data-driven approach to do this empirically by driving all these vehicles around to collect data, it really is a, it's sort of intractable because you have to drive too many miles to actually prove that the system works just empirically. And so there's really a need for formal methods to actually you know, show this uh, meets the target level of safety uh, to, in, that, in that domain. And then the last one was really that, you know, you have, it's a hard problem. It's, it's hard to prove that it does it. And so how do you actually get there? <laughs> um, getting there is, is sort of the, is the new challenge. And um, there's a lot of technologies out there, but um, there's, I guess, in our view, some fundamental new pieces of infrastructure that would probably be needed to, to get you there to solve the problem. What I saw, which was very interesting in your paper, that 
you divided your requirements by a different kind of, uh, of the icons. It's like, you don't have the same requirements for small car, a truck, uh, and everything has been really well organized. Can you, can you tell us a bit more about that? So yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So this, and that's a great point that you raised, Wild Rather, this, you know, breaking it up by different vehicle classes. I'll say the requirements we set out are, are nothing uh, that complicated in the sense we wanted to tie it to something physical. And the physical thing we tied it to is that, you know, vehicles are a certain size and they need to stay in a certain box in order for them to not hit other things in the world and, and kind of actually achieve the goal that they're trying to achieve, which is stay in the lane to first order. And if you're a smaller car and if you're on the highway, you have a lot more room around you. So if you're, you know, a small compact car or if you're, or if you're a large pickup truck, uh, the larger the vehicle, the more that eats into your air budget. You know, in a sense, when you're building these requirements, uh, you want to tie it to something as physical as possible because the, the, that's what it all comes down to in the end, is you're trying to sort of maintain a physical boundary around the vehicle so that you stay in your, uh, stay in your 